circuitry of a horny male through sheer pleasure overload. <laughs> he uses exponents and everything. I am not kidding. I've brought the, I expected skepticism. I've brought the book. I've, I've bookmarked it. And it always seemed to me that somebody who would go to that kind of trouble to make those kind of calculations and then put them out in public may have taken such an interest in the next life, probably because he wasn't getting out a whole lot in this one. Um, and this would be a great place to segue into the whole pornography part of the talk, but there's something else I want to touch on first, and that's time. We mammals are not very good at grasping time, and that's because time is something we as a species only figured out very recently. For most of our existence as vertebrates, we were pretty much frogs. We lived in the moment. If we saw something, we would react to it. If we heard something, we would react to it. At the moment it left our perceptual sphere, it was out of sight, out of mind. Then, according to at least one school of thought, we started throwing rocks at moving targets. And at that point, we had to develop a measure of time because we had to throw our rock not at where the target was, but where it was going to be. And so we developed these little cortical time series buffers, these little caches which have since gotten used for anything from, yes, continuing to throw rocks at things, but we also use them to appreciate music and sonatas and so on because, of course, you need that sort of time series analysis capability. But all of this is still a very recent development in evolutionary terms, and we still live primarily in the moment. And this is why in any number of psych experiments, you've probably heard about them, people given a choice between $5 today and $10 in two weeks, almost invariably choose $5 today because the present just seems more real to them. I suspect it may also be why so many people are blaming Obama for um, an economic meltdown that happened before he ever took office. I mean, intellectually, people know that. But Obama's in the White House now, and now is basically all that matters. So the story so far, natural selection has no foresight. Evolution has not gifted us with a gut appreciation of long-term consequences. It has, however, predisposed us to paranoia as a survival strategy, which means that a number of symptoms manifest themselves, especially when we are under stress. We see patterns where none exist. We draw spurious and unhelpful correlations, like for existence between all dark-skinned people and suicide bombers. We become susceptible to imaginary patterns ranging from religion to conspiracy theories. Obamacare is a, a socialist plot to kill grandma. <laughs> you laughed. Do you guys not watch Keith Olbermann? We become especially vulnerable to political and religious systems that emphasize surveillance and obedience to arbitrary rules which strongly discourage individual initiative because, let's face it, empirically in the past, these are the societies that have lasted the longer. Big problems tend to be complex problems. Complex problems seem intractable, makes us feel powerless. Uh, powerless people become more paranoid. That makes them more susceptible to repressive religions. Remember Jennifer Whitson's findings. What we have here is a positive feedback loop that results in us rejecting shades of gray, deri uh, deriding moral relativists, and taking comfort in black and white solutions, even though they're 100% bullshit, because at least a black and white solution is something you can understand. You do not feel so powerless. Things go from bad to worse. People who claim that masturbation equals adultery and stem cell research has produced mice with fully functioning human brains, these people stop being laughing stocks and start spearheading major political movements. I mean, seriously, if I had told you guys about Christine O'Donnell 20 years ago, would anybody have believed me? <laughs> so let's say climate change. Climate change is an almost perfect example of what I'm talking about. It's a big problem. It's a complex problem. It offers a, clear cho uh, a really clear-cut choice between inconvenience today and catastrophe in the future. Actually, the catastrophes have already started, um, but we're still at the shame about all the cancer, but you still can't prove it's cigarettes that cause it phase. And so, as a species, we have unhesitatingly chosen catastrophe because we don't really believe in it. It's decades away. The scientists will come up with something. The whole thing's a hoax anyway because, as we all know, the Green Party runs the world. <laughs> so we deny climate change for the same reason we embrace the police state. We feel threatened. We feel powerless. We are afraid. As long as we stay stuck in that cycle, we are screwed. So how do we get out of it? How do we short-circuit these limbic cycle of fear? How do you encourage individual schmoes like you and I to actually come to grips with long-term issues of world-changing magnitude? Everyone likes to talk about education as if we had all the time in the world, as if all the catastrophes that we've brewed would just sort of sit back patiently while we raise a more enlightened generation. 
And I remain skeptical of that. We've had, we've had lots of time for education. It hasn't really worked because, as Einstein put it, you cannot reason somebody out of a position they did not arrive at through reason. Um, deniers are not motivated by data. They are motivated by fear. More data won't change anything. I thought I had these people beaten. I thought I had their asses kicked. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses came to my door once and told me what a lie evolution was. And I had been waiting for months since I had come up with this. And I said, well, I guess that means that you know, Noah and, and his entire family must have been absolutely infested with the clap. And they sort of blinked. And I said, well, think about it. There's over 40 species of sexually transmitted disease that only infect human beings. And if, uh, and if evolution is a lie, then the only way all those STDs could have made it through the ark bottleneck would be if Noah and his family were more rotten with spirochetes than the lowest hooker in Gomorrah. They didn't miss a beat. They even had an answer. It was like, oh yes, but STDs are God's punishment to women for, for being wicked and original sin and, and eating the fruit of the tree. And I mean, if I, had been, if I had had my wits about me, I would have said, okay, well then let it affect women. But... <laughs> Couldn't God have like, token, t- chosen his targets a bit more discriminately? Uh, but I didn't. I was just so absolutely gobsmacked. This, to me, was an unassailable, factually-based argument. Didn't slow them down. It didn't even cause them to blink. So, so much for education. Appeals to the future. Hey, dude, you've got to give up your SUV and your big screen TV now so that somebody else's great-grandchildren can have a good life sometime after you're dead? That's not going to cut any ice with the species for whom now is all that actually exists. I mean, if that worked, nature would never have had to trick us by inventing the orgasm. We would just sort of grimly bump and grind out of some kind of a cognitive long-term awareness that we had to keep the species going. But there, I think, might be the glimmer of an answer which would be sex. <laughs> now, I have traditionally been very fond of saying that we will not deserve this exalted place, that we've, we've, this pedestal we put ourselves on in the animal kingdom, until we learn to use our brains to control our instincts instead of merely coming up with really complicated excuses for them. And I'm starting to think that I might have been wrong about that, because controlling our instincts just doesn't seem to be working out that well. So maybe it's time to use them instead. I'm talking about hacking our brains so that our instincts become part of the solution. We're wired for instant gratification. We don't have any grasp of long-term consequences. Maybe we should stop trying to repress human nature and start using it to our advantage. Maybe we should stop bemoaning our need for self-gratification and figure out how to indulge it in a way that actually promotes long-term benefits. Now, if cutting back on your carbon emissions actually gave you a hard on, (laughs) if beating your neighbor at reducing carbon footprints literally caused an orgasm, I think the problems would probably resolve themselves in about two weeks. (laughs) Existential dread wouldn't matter. We wouldn't care about the odds against us. Uh, We wouldn't be doing it for some distant future that our gut doesn't even deserve. We'd just be doing it because it felt good right now, and that's really the only reason we do anything. How exactly do we go about this? Well, uh, the techniques we need to precisely rewire ourselves at the synaptic level are nowhere near ready for prime time yet. Uh, Although there are some mind-controlling parasites that we could learn some valuable lessons from. Uh, For example, I may owe my pathological fondness uh, for cats to a toxoplasma infection. (laughs) Even if we had the technology to surgically rewire entire populations, there might be ethical concerns raised by those who think that behavior modification is immoral, that it should be reserved by selling people for things like selling toothpaste and telling people which gods to worship. On the other hand, some of you may have heard of something called Rule 34. <laughs> now, I have no idea what the other 33 are. But you really only need to surf the web for about seven and a half minutes to be convinced that rule number 34 is really onto something. I am still amazed by all the different things people get off on. Gas masks, ero- autoerotic asphyxiation, homunculi, vor, gynephagia, scabs and vacuum cleaners, foot fetishes. I'm led to believe that some of the brain circuitry responsible for sexual arousal actually butts up physically. 
against other brain circuitry that's responsible for processing sensory information from the feet. And you crosswire those two parts of the brain and maybe throw in a couple of mirror neurons to allow you to generalize your own foot impulses to the sight of somebody else's feet, I can see the beginnings of how a mechanism like that might get started. It's all very conjectural. I can also see a mechanism, I think, for the whole furry sex thing, so common in science fiction circles, but I would really rather not think about it too much. <laughs> My point is, there is no end to the range of things that people get turned on by, and all these weird and wonderful perversions occur without any invasive high-tech microsurgery at all. Most of them just seem to happen by accident. So here is a hopeful note to end on. Rule 34 might be the key to our salvation. I do not know, I do not pretend to know the nuts and bolts to exactly how we would do this, but that is not my job. Uh, there are, however, advertisers out there and marketers, people whose job it is, they use sex to sell automobiles, they use babies to sell radial tires. If stunt fun, they, they, they can convince millions of people to buy albums by Celine Dion. <laughs> if society can spontaneously give rise to thriving communities that get off on eating each other's feces, hacking the sexual response and service of world peace and a healthy environment should be child's play if we just put our damn minds to it. So forget neurosurgery, forget science to some extent. You really want to save the world? We should probably be watching Mad Men. And at the very least, um, it might make a great premise for a new kind of science fiction. That's all I got.